About that time, the chief of the Badonkahe Apaches, Mangus Colorado, went to make a peace treaty with the American settlers. He took three warriors and decided to meet with U.S. military leaders at Fort McLean in New Mexico. He was promised blankets, flour, beef, and all manner of supplies in return for peace and living near the fort in Apache Tejo. Chief Mangas arrived under a flag of truce to meet with Brigadier General Joseph Rodman West, an officer of the California militia. Mangas Colorado deliberately walked into a trap set by Captain E.D. Sherlin and his company of volunteers, sending his warriors back to their camp and entering the enemy camp alone. As the old chief sat by the fire, Colonel J.R. West rode into camp and ordered two armed guards placed over the chief. One of them heated his bayonet in the campfire and suddenly, near midnight, stabbed Mangus Colorado in the leg. When he got up, the guards fired their rifles into him, then drew their revolvers and emptied them into his body. It was later learned that they were acting under the orders of West. Since they hadn't heard anything for several weeks, the band, low on supplies and arms, decided to retreat into the mountains near Apache Pass. In the process, they encountered four men with a herd of cattle. They killed the men and took the cattle. While they were packing the meat, they were attacked by mounted U.S. troops. They killed seven Apaches, so the natives had to retreat and scatter. The U.S. troops attacked the Apaches again a few times while they were retreating. When they found out that Mangas Colorado had been killed, Geronimo was chosen as the new chief. After about a year of peace, U.S. soldiers attacked the band's camp. They killed seven children, five women, and four warriors, capturing all their supplies, blankets, horses, and clothing, and destroyed the teepees. The Apaches had nothing left, and winter was beginning. The Badonkahe Apaches heard that Chief Victorio of the Chichen Apaches was holding a council with the white settlers near Hot Springs in New Mexico, and that he had plenty of provisions. They had always been on friendly terms with this tribe, and Victorio was especially kind to Geronimo's people. The band went to Hot Springs, they easily found Victorio and his band, and they gave them supplies for the winter. The Badonkahes stayed with the Shehen for about a year, and during this stay they had perfect peace. They had not the least trouble with Mexicans, white men, or natives. When the band stayed as long as they should, and had again accumulated some supplies, they decided to leave Victorio's band. When Geronimo told him that, Victorio stated the two bands should have a feast and dance before they separated. The festivities were held about two miles above Hot Springs and lasted for four days. There were about 400 Apaches at this celebration. Geronimo later recalled in his autobiography that he doesn't think they ever spent a more pleasant time than upon this occasion. The two bands remained very close. After returning home in the fall of 1864, 20 warriors agreed to go with Geronimo on another raid into Mexico. They were all chosen men, well-armed and equipped for battle. The Apaches provided for the safety of their families before starting raids. Their whole tribe would scatter and then reassemble at a camp about 40 or 50 miles from the former place. In this way, it would be hard for the Mexicans to trail them and the warriors would know where to find their families when they return. Moreover, if any hostile native tribe should see a large number of warriors leaving, they might attack the camp. But if they found no one, their raid would fail. Geronimo went south through the Chacon and Apaches range, entered Sonora, Mexico at a point directly south of Tombstone, Arizona, and went into hiding in the Sierra de Antunes Mountains. Then they attacked several settlements and acquired enough supplies to last another year. After three days, they attacked a mule train with three people on board. One was killed while two got away. As night was beginning to fall, they discovered the train was full of mescal, 
so the whole group immediately started drinking. Geronimo also drank, but just a little bit. He didn't want to get drunk. After getting drunk, an inner fight started. Geronimo tried to stop it, but he was unable. After the Apaches got so drunk they couldn't fight each other anymore, Geronimo threw out all the alcohol and put out the fires in the camp because he was expecting a counterattack. The Mexicans were nowhere to be seen all night, so the group started heading home. On the way up north, they seized some cattle. They came home, started a feast, and once again Geronimo and his men secured the goods for the survival of the winter. During 1865, Geronimo and four warriors raided deep into Mexico, eventually reaching the Gulf of California. Once again, raiding multiple settlements on the way, they secured plenty of supplies. When they came back northwest, they secured about 60 head of cattle and drove them home in Arizona. After another successful raid, a feast was made at the tribe home while the meat was packed and stored. In fall of the same year, Geronimo led nine warriors on foot on a raid in the Sonora region. After looting a few villages, the group collected many horses and mules near the town of Arispe. Just when they thought they weren't being followed and began eating soup, Apache scouts came running, telling them there were Mexicans coming. A few moments later, Mexican troops opened fire from the hills. The Apaches scattered in all directions, and the troops recovered everything. After the return home, Geronimo had nothing to say, but he was anxious to carry on raiding. Early next summer, in 1866, Geronimo took 30 mounted warriors and invaded Mexican territory. They collected all the horses, mules, and cattle they wanted and drove them northward through Sonora back home into Arizona. The Mexicans saw the Apaches many times and in many places, but they did not attack them. On the other side during this raid, the Apaches had killed about 50 Mexicans. About two years after this, in 1868, Mexican troops rounded up all the horses and mules of the tribe not far from the Apache settlement. No raids had been made into Mexico that year, and the Apaches were not expecting any attacks. They were all in camp, having just returned from hunting. About two o'clock in the afternoon, two Mexican scouts were seen near the settlement. Apaches killed these scouts, but Mexican troops got underway with a herd of horses and mules before the Apaches saw them. Geronimo gathered about twenty warriors and trailed them. They found the stock at a cattle ranch in Sonora and attacked the cowboys who had them in charge. They killed two cowboys in the fight. After that, Apaches drove off the stock. But they were trailed by nine cowboys. Geronimo decided it was best to divide into two groups, one large that would lead the herd home and the second small that would stay in the rear and intercept any incoming enemies. Geronimo and three warriors stayed in the rear. One night they saw the cowboys trailing the main group. The cowboys made camp and went to sleep for the night, so Geronimo and his warriors snuck into their camp and stole their horses. Then they reached the main group and rode home fast. Back at home, everyone was happy with the outcome. It was a long time before the band again went into Mexico or were disturbed by the Mexicans. Those who followed Geronimo credited him with a variety of supernatural powers, including the ability to heal the sick, slow time, avoid bullets, bring on rainstorms, and even witness events over great distances. In one incident, described by Apache Jason Betsinas, a few warriors were sitting around a campfire during a raiding expedition when Geronimo suddenly had a premonition that U.S. troops had attacked their base camp. After arriving at the site several days later, they found that Geronimo's vision had been correct. The Americans had already captured the encampment. I cannot explain it to this day, Betsinas later wrote, but I was there and I saw it. Heavy Fighting in 1872, the Apaches were attacked by Mexican troops in their settlement, but they defeated them. 
Then the Apaches decided to make raids into Mexico. This time they moved their whole camp, packing all their belongings on mules and horses. Moving into Mexico, they made camp in the mountains near Nacori Chico, often changing their place of rendezvous. While passing through Mexican territory, the band would encounter Mexican homes. If the inhabitants offered to surrender and didn't make any resistance or trouble in any way, they would be taken prisoners and eventually integrated into the band. Otherwise, they would be killed on the spot, which was frequently the case. The band lived in the camp and roamed the mountains, raiding Mexican settlements for supplies, but not having any general engagement with Mexican troops. After some time, they returned home to Arizona. After remaining in Arizona for about a year, the band returned to Mexico and went into hiding in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Their camp was near Nacori Chico, and they had just organized bands of warriors for raiding the country when Apache scouts discovered Mexican troops coming toward the camp to attack them. Geronimo's band was not alone. The Nedney Apaches were with them, and their chief, Jew, commanded one division. The warriors all marched toward the troops and met them at a place about five miles from the Apache camp. Apaches showed themselves to the soldiers, and they quickly rode to the top of a hill and dismounted, placing their horses on the outside for protection. It was a round hill, very steep and rocky, and there was no timber on its sides. There were two companies of Mexican cavalry, and the Apaches had about sixty warriors, they crawled up the hill behind the rocks as Mexicans began firing. Soon the Apaches managed to kill all the Mexican horses as they were lying down shooting from behind them. At this point, the Apaches killed several Mexican soldiers while suffering no losses yet. After a couple hours of fighting and being in a stalemate, Geronimo gave the sign, and Apaches swarmed the soldiers. The soldiers were so confused, they tried to run away in multiple directions, but all the ways were blocked. The Apaches killed and scalped them all. They carried away their dead and took arms and supplies. That night, they moved their camp east through the Sierra Madre Mountains into Chihuahua. The band stayed there for some time and then returned home to Arizona. Almost every year, the Badoncaje Apache would live sometime in Arizona and sometime in Old Mexico, where they would live with the Nedney Apaches. The leaders of the bands were close friends. In 1873, a company of Mexican troops attacked the band south of Casa Grande. There were 24 Mexican soldiers and about 40 Apaches. The Mexicans surprised the Apaches in camp and fired on them, killing two in the first volley. The Apaches were in the timber, and Geronimo gave the order to go forward and fight at close range. Warriors kept behind rocks and trees until they came within ten yards of the Mexican line. Then they stood up and both sides shot until all the Mexicans were killed. Apaches lost twelve warriors in this battle. They buried their dead and secured supplies from the dead Mexican soldiers. After that, the band moved northeast near Nacori Chico. There they were attacked once again by Mexican soldiers. There were about 80 warriors from both Badoncaje and Nedney Apache bands and three companies of Mexican troops. The Mexicans attacked the Apaches in an open field, and they scattered, firing as they ran. The soldiers followed them, but Apaches disappeared and soon escaped the soldiers' pursuit. Apache bands from that territory reassembled in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Here a council was held, and as Mexican troops were coming from many quarters, they decided the best thing was to disband and keep a low profile. After months of skirmishes in the mountains, Apaches and Mexicans decided on a peace treaty at Casas Grandes, Chihuahua, Mexico. After terms were agreed, the trading of goods began, and the Mexicans gave mezcal to the Apaches. While they were intoxicated, they attacked and killed 20 Apaches and captured many. 
the Apaches were forced to retreat into the mountains once again. A Taste of the Reservation After the treachery and massacre of Casas Grandes, the band returned to Arizona. At that time, Cochise and U.S. General Howard had arranged a meeting for a peace treaty. Since Cochise was the chief of the Chiricahua Apache, he sent for all the other subsection band chiefs, which included Geronimo as the Bedonkahe band chief. General Howard agreed to make Chiricahua's homeland as their reservation. The agency was established near Fort Bowie, and the Chiricahua Apaches entered a period of peace in the San Carlos Reservation. Geronimo remembered General Howard with affection, saying that all the natives respected him because he was always fair, and his purpose was always to maintain peace. On the reservation, Apaches got a good amount of food and supplies. Unfortunately, General Howard soon went away, and some trouble started on the reservation, with Apaches killing a white man who was the owner of a general store, getting drunk and fighting each other. After this trouble, Apaches concluded it was impossible to keep the different bands together in peace. Therefore, they separated, each leader taking his own band. Some of them went to the San Carlos Reservation and some to Old Mexico. But Geronimo took his band back to Hot Springs, to the Ojo Caliente Reservation, and rejoined Victorio's band. This was seen as an infraction in the treaty, so scouts were sent from the San Carlos Reservation to Hot Springs and contacted Geronimo and Victorio. Not sensing the danger, they met with U.S. officials in town. The soldiers took them into custody. They released Victorio shortly later, but imprisoned Geronimo and seven other Apaches, keeping them in chains. When he asked them why that was, they said it was because he left the Apache Pass. Geronimo was imprisoned for four months. After that, he was transferred back to San Carlos Reservation, where he was tried and freed. Geronimo and his band remained on the reservation for the next two years. They were not feeling secure because the army was scouting and killing Apaches that were not on the reservation. In the summer of 1883, a rumor was going around that the officers were again planning to imprison Apache leaders. It was also said that authorities were planning on killing Geronimo. Geronimo's Mightiest Battle Back at the San Carlos Reservation in 1883, spurred by Geronimo, hundreds of Apaches left the reservation and started traveling south. Many great warriors answered the call. They settled in the mountain ranges of Mexico, having skirmishes with the U.S. Army on the way. The Chiricahua Apaches hid caches of food and supplies across much of the southwest and Mexico. Geronimo trained young warriors. He despised the leaders of his people who gave up easily or made choices that led to their capture or death. Geronimo even went so far as to force Chief Loco and his band to depart the San Carlos Reservation at gunpoint. The Chiricahua at this point numbered around 600. The U.S. Army was also chasing the Apaches, so Americans and Mexicans made a deal of freely crossing the border in order to defeat the natives. Geronimo's Bedonkahes made camp near Arispe. After a while, their scouts saw Mexican troops coming from multiple sides and U.S. troops coming from the north. Not wanting to be surrounded, they kept moving south and made camp near some mountains and just by a small stream of water. The next morning, just at daybreak, Apache scouts reported that Mexican troops were approaching. Within five minutes, the Mexicans began firing on Apaches. The Apaches took to the ditches made by the stream keeping the women and children busy digging these ditches deeper. Geronimo gave strict orders to waste no ammunition and to keep under cover. The Apaches killed many Mexicans that day, but also suffered many losses, for the fight lasted all day. Frequently, troops would charge at one point, be repulsed, then rally and charge at another point. About noon, 
Geronimo began to hear Mexican soldiers speaking his name with curses. In the afternoon, the Mexican general came on the field, and the fighting became more furious. Geronimo gave orders to his warriors to try to kill all the Mexican officers. About three o'clock, the general called all the officers together at the right side of the field. The place where they assembled was not very far from the main stream, and the little ditch ran out close to where the officers stood. Cautiously, Geronimo crawled out of this ditch, very close to where the council was being held. The general was an old warrior. The wind was blowing in Geronimo's direction, so he could hear all they said. This is about what he heard. Officers, in those ditches is the red devil Geronimo and his hated band. This must be his last day. Ride on him from both sides of the ditches. Kill men, women, and children. Take no prisoners. Dead Indians are what we want. Do not spare your own men. Exterminate this band at any cost. I will shoot all deserters. Go back to your companies and advance. Just as the command to go forward was given, Geronimo took aim at the general and shot him. He fell instantly. In an instant, the ground around Geronimo was riddled with bullets, but he was untouched. His Apaches had seen this act and gained courage. From all along the ditches arose the fierce war cry of the Apaches. The Mexican columns wavered, and the Apache fire had destroyed the front ranks. After this, the Mexicans' fighting were not so fierce, yet they continued to rally and re-advance until dark. That night, before the firing had ceased, a dozen Apaches had crawled out of the ditches and set fire to the long prairie grass behind the Mexican troops. During the confusion that followed among Mexican ranks, Apaches escaped to the mountains. This was the last major battle that Geronimo ever fought with Mexicans, as from now on the U.S. government was his bigger enemy. General George Crook, who fought many times with the natives, came to fight the Apaches. Chief Nana saw his return as good because he was a good enemy. Like Nana, Crook had also had a strong respect for his enemy. General Crook was able to track Geronimo. Realizing he was at a huge number disadvantage, Geronimo decided to meet Crook. After a while, the two met and negotiations started. Why did you leave the reservation? asked Crook. You told me that I might live in the reservation the same as white people lived. One year I raised a crop of corn and gathered and stored it, and the next year I put in a crop of oats, and when the crop was almost ready to harvest, you told your soldiers to put me in prison, and if I resisted, to kill me. If I had been let alone, I would now have been in good circumstances, but instead of that, you and the Mexicans are hunting me with soldiers, Geronimo said. Crook replied, I never gave any such orders. The troops at Fort Apache, who spread this report, knew that it was untrue. After that, Geronimo agreed to go back with Crook to the reservation. They struck a bargain that the Chiricahua would move to a new reservation, called Turkey Creek. Geronimo never believed General Crook. He wasn't happy living on a reservation. The U.S. government started to impose stricter rules on the Apaches, so when he heard he was going to be arrested again, Geronimo decided to escape again. Most of the Chiricahua remained on reservations this time. The remaining free Chiricahua took up hiding once again in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Crook pursued Geronimo into Mexico one last time. When he found him, Crook was upset with Geronimo for breaking all of their deals. Geronimo pleaded that he wouldn't have broken the deals if he hadn't heard that he was going to be arrested. Crook was not able to offer the terms of surrender that he was able to before. Geronimo knew his cause to be hopeless and surrendered once again. But on the way back to the U.S., the Apaches, led by Geronimo, slipped away from the army. That cost General Crook his place, 
and he was replaced by General Miles. A $25,000 bounty was placed on Geronimo's head. Fear gripped the Southwest during the final summer of Chiricahua freedom in 1886. The final free band of Chiricahua numbered only 37 people. They included 18 warriors, 13 women, and 6 children, including 2 infants. They remained at large for five months, while around 5,000 soldiers of the United States Army were stationed in the area to track the Apache. Around 3,000 Mexican soldiers and a little less than 1,000 volunteers were also put to the task. Geronimo's band killed cattle to eat whenever they were in need of food, but they frequently suffered greatly for water. Through old Mexico, they attacked every Mexican they found, even if for no other reason than to kill. They believed the Mexicans had asked the United States troops to come down to Mexico and fight them. In overview, the last six years of the war had cost the lives of 319 Americans and 682 Mexicans. There were still 434 Chiricahua living on the San Carlos Reservation. Miles' idea was to banish all of them to prisons thousands of miles away in Florida. The Free Chiricahua remaining had close family members in this group. Miles hoped that knowing they would never see their families again without surrendering would cause a final Chiricahua Apache surrender. Late that summer, Lieutenant Charles Gatewood pursued Geronimo and his band deep into the Sierra Madre. At a place in the mountains called Bavispe, he knew he was closing in. Gatewood sent two Apache scouts forward, who some of the Free Chiricahua Band had personally known. The scouts told Geronimo and his band that the rest of their people, including their families, had been sent thousands of miles away. This had the intended effect. When Miles and Geronimo finally met, Miles began the negotiations. He promised Geronimo that his band would see their families in five days and that he wouldn't be arrested. Geronimo accepted the treaty and surrendered for the last time. A Prisoner of War Unknown to the Chiricahua, Miles had decided that since Geronimo had broken all of his prior conditions of surrender, all terms agreed upon were now null. The U.S. government never intended to allow the Apache to see their families when they got to Florida. Geronimo and his band were taken to Fort Bowie, where Geronimo drank from Apache Spring one last time. It was at this site he had fought next to Chief Cochise 24 years prior at the Battle of Apache Pass. Geronimo was now 65 years old. He took his last steps on his native land and entered a train car, for the first time in his life, bound for Florida. The U.S. government had rid itself of the Apache problem once and for all. The first group of Chiricahua Apache who had been moved to Florida were suffering due to malaria. They were moved to Mount Vernon in Alabama as prisoners of war. It was an unfamiliar landscape to them in the tall trees instead of open desert plains. Their children were sent to schools in Pennsylvania to learn Christianity, English, and other aspects of the American lifestyle. Many of these children caught tuberculosis and died. Chiricahua parents back in Alabama began to hide their children so that they wouldn't be taken away. After two years of imprisonment in Florida, Geronimo and his band were moved to Alabama and were finally allowed to see their families once again. When the Chiricahua were moved to Oklahoma in 1894, there were 119 left. It was the first time in eight years that they could once again hear the coyote howl and collect their prized mesquite beans. Geronimo toured the nation performing for fairs and exhibitions such as the Buffalo Bill Sideshow. He sold little trinkets such as buttons from his coat, which he could replace. Geronimo's most famous public appearance came on March 4, 1905, 
when he took part in President Theodore Roosevelt's inaugural parade in Washington, D.C. Flanked by five other Indian leaders, the elderly warrior rode a pony down Pennsylvania Avenue, eliciting cries of hooray for Geronimo from spectators. Five days later, the natives got a chance to speak to Roosevelt in person at the White House. Geronimo, still a prisoner of war, took the opportunity to plead with the president to send the Chiricahuas back to their native lands in the West. I pray you to cut the ropes and make me free, he said. By then, nearly twenty years had passed since Geronimo's surrender, but Roosevelt turned down the request out of fear that war would once again break out if the Apaches returned home. In his final years, Geronimo studied Christianity. Throughout his life, he had nine wives and seven children. In 1909, Geronimo was returning from a drinking binge one night when he fell off his horse into a ditch. He stayed in the ditch until morning and contracted pneumonia. Before he died, Geronimo stated that he never should have surrendered, but instead should have died fighting. He passed away days later. The federal government wouldn't free the Chiricahuas until 1913, four years after Geronimo's death. Thank you for watching. If you liked the content, please consider sharing the video and supporting the channel on Patreon. We've also launched our merch, so make sure to check it out. The link is in the description.